And now a little story from the apple seed. Well, my brother Damien is 18 months older than me. And from the moment he appeared in my life, he set out to make it his life's mission to traumatize me. So, for example, for my third birthday, I got a walkie-talkie doll. He was fascinated by her. When I went to sleep that afternoon, he decided to investigate. He took off her head. He disemboweled her. He wanted to see how she worked. He couldn't put her back together, and nor could anyone else. And then we shared a room together for some time. Every morning, now I have to tell you, he had a collection of matchbox toy cars. And every morning, every single morning, I would wake up with a car on my face, revving its engine. Hrm, 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 every single morning. And then when I was a little older, I had a teddy bear that I absolutely adored. Well, I came in our bedroom one time and there was Teresa, my teddy bear, hanging from a light fixture with a noose around her neck. And a sign attached to her stomach that said, I can't take it anymore. He was a pest. Damien was a pest, an absolute pest. And I adored him. And so did my parents. He was the only son. He was the golden boy. He could do no harm until he started to limp and limp really badly. Now, my brother had been born with spina bifida and he'd had the operation when he was little, but hadn't developed any problems walking. However, every year the specialist would phone my mother to see if he had developed problems walking. So when she saw this limp, which appeared overnight, it seemed, and was really serious, she phoned up the specialist and he said, Mrs. Buckley, Mrs. Buckley, we need to bring him in. You need to bring him into the hospital tomorrow. We need to run some tests. So the next morning, my mother collected my brother, brother and I and set off for the hospital. We left my father behind. They had a very successful hotel and restaurant. It was particularly known for the restaurant side, which was booming. And so my father stayed back to look after the lunch crowd. And I remember walking through the long, cold hospital corridors, holding my mother's hand and, and smelling that, that special smell of, of disinfectant and stewing cabbage <laughs> and loneliness. And my brother was walking just a few steps ahead. But he was, normally, he was an enthusiastic, uh, bouncing, annoying little boy. But on this occasion, he was bent over like a little old man, and it looked as though he was having problems lifting up his leg. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. Well, when the specialist saw this, he said, Mrs. Buckley, Mrs. Buckley, this is really serious. We need to keep him in overnight. In fact, probably for a few nights, we need to run a series of tests. Well, that night was the first time I remembered being in our room by myself ever. And my mother came in to tuck me and say prayers with me. And she said, darling, don't worry. Damien will be back soon. And he was back soon, but he was still limping. So my mother went to see her aunt, my great aunt, Eileen, who lived with us. She was in charge of the stockroom in the, the restaurant. And she said, Aunt Eileen, Aunt Eileen, they, they've done the tests and, and the tests for, for spina bifida have come back negative and they're, going to, they're doing other tests. And we're going to get the results in a, a few days' time. Dr. Lahan, the family doctor, is going to come and tell us. But Aunt Eileen, they think it might be polio. And my, my great Aunt Eileen said, oh, no, no, not polio. This was two years before the polio vaccine had been brought into Britain. And in fact, up till the, a, a few years before that, there had been several serious polio outbreaks. And many people had died, particularly children. And if they survived, they often had problems walking. So they would be in calipers or in wheelchairs, and sometimes they develop problems breathing. And they'd have to be in these machines where they laid out with only their head out, and they'd be in there for days or weeks or sometimes months. They were called iron lungs. And nobody would let a child or anybody else go anywhere where they thought there was a likelihood, even a slight possibility they might get polio, because people were so terrified of polio. Well, those next few days, they dragged by. My father banged pots and pans even more loudly than normal in the kitchen. My mother, who's a good Irish Catholic woman, she prayed to the Almighty, but also to St. Jude, who's the patron saint of hopeless cases. And it seemed like a pall was over the place. But finally, Dr. Lahan came back. And as I said, he was a family friend. He gathered us all in the living room. And he said to my mother, now, the tests have come back. And for polio, it's, 
they're negative. However, the specialist is seriously worried and he wants me to see this lamp. Would you get Damien to come and walk over to me? And my mother said, certainly. She said, Damien, walk over to Dr. Lahad and he's got a couple of, of sweeties, a couple of pieces of candy. You take one and give one to Geraldine. So Damien set off across the room. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. He took the candy. Did he give one to me? No, he did not. <laughs> but Dr. Lahan said, Valerie, this is serious. I've got to treat this as though it is polio. Now, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go away for a week. And when I come back, if that limp is still there, I'm afraid I'm going to have to put the, the whole place into quarantine. And my mother said, no, 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 put the steward into quarantine. No, she said, it's not polio. I just know it's not. And Dr. Lahan said, Valerie, I am so sorry, but I won't have any other option. That week dragged by. My father banged those pots and pans even louder in the kitchen. My mother prayed more fervently. And even though I was young, I knew that this was really serious. This was the only place I'd ever known, the only place I'd ever lived. This was our livelihood. And I knew enough to know that if the place, if the steward was put into quarantine, even if the quarantine was lifted, no one would ever come back because people were so terrified of polio. Well, finally, the week did pass. And Dr. Lahan came back. He saw Damien. He was still limping. So he gathered us all again in the living room and he said, Valerie, I am so sorry. The moment I leave here, I'm going to put in the, the order for the quarantine. Well, at that moment, the door opened and my great aunt Eileen came in. Now, she was badly crippled with rheumatoid arthritis. She, her feet were very misshapen. She couldn't fit into ordinary shoes, so she had to shuffle along in big brown men's slippers with the help of a cane. And she saw her favourite chair on the other side of the room and it was empty, so she started off towards it. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. Damien got up, stood right behind her, bent over like a little old man and started to follow her. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. Shuffle, shuffle, drag. Damien was imitating Aunt Eileen. <laughs> Dr. Lahan said, I wouldn't have believed it unless I'd seen it with my own eyes. Damien is imitating his great aunt. <laughs> and my mother said, you mean to say he doesn't have polio? And Dr. Lahan said, no, he said, because the test came back negative and now I know where it came from. So my mother said, well, Damien, come over here, not like Aunt Eileen, come and walk over here, like a little boy. My brother was incapable of being like a little boy. He galloped over there as though he was a pony. <laughs> Well, they all hugged him and they loved him. They were so grateful he didn't have polio. Quite frankly, I thought they should have killed him. <laughs> but oh no, 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 he was back to being the golden boy. So that was the first time that we realised that my brother had such a gift of mimicry. And over the years, he set out to make good his promise to traumatise me. <laughs> so I've lived in different parts of the world and I've had phone calls. I had one from a South African lawyer offering me a plum job, another from a Pakistani professor giving me the, the results of long-awaited tests, another from a police official telling me I had so many parking tickets I was going to be incarcerated. <laughs> and right till the end of the conversation, I believed them, and then I realised it was Damien. <laughs> And over the years, he has done some truly terrible, terrible, awful things to me. But even at his worst, which has been bad, even at his worst, I'm so glad that the polio didn't take him. And I still have a pesky, pesky brother. However, people have said to me, why did you not try and get revenge? But I have a very bad case of sibling amnesia. So I know that my brother absolutely loves me and he would never do anything to harm me until he does. <laughs> and then I quickly forget about it. But I thought that everything would change after he turned, well, after he became an adult, really, but after he got married. And he was due to get married the summer that he turned 23, the June he turned 23, to an absolutely gorgeous young woman called Nancy. He's still married to her. They're going to have their 40th wedding anniversary next year. Now, I have always known what Damien saw in Nancy because she is a superb person. I've never understood what Nancy have see, ever saw in my brother. I mean, really. <laughs> I mean, you know, the strangest taste, strangest taste, but even so. 
Even so. So they were getting married in the June in London, in England, and I lived in London as well. Well, the oddest thing happened in the January. I started to get very, very itchy. I mean, really itchy. But I just started a new job at the BBC, which I was very excited about, a creative job. And I decided to go very, very English, even though I really am an Irish peasant woman with a thin veneer of English, English respectability, very thin at times. I, I decided to compartmentalise. The British are very good at that. And just, just put it in one corner because I really wanted to throw myself into the job. But by... March, I was incredibly itchy. I mean, really, everything itched except my, my hair and my private parts, thank goodness. But everything else was very, very, very itchy. Well, at that time, my parents came over. They lived in Spain, which sounds very exotic, but it's only two and a half hours from London. It's like if you live on the East Coast retiring to Florida. And I was in their hotel room in London, and I was having a quick itch. And my father said, Geraldine, he said, that's clearly stress. I mean, you need, it's the, the, it's the new job. That's what it is. Stress does incredible things. You need vitamins, vitamin B. Here's, here's a packet of B12, take them. And my mother said, that's all very well and good. She said, but, but she needs to see a doctor and I'll make her an appointment. So I found myself at a specialist and, and um, it was the most beautiful place, a, a Big room with, with beautiful carving in the, in the walls and a lovely ceiling, not like any other normal doctor's office. And that's when I realised my mother didn't know any doctors in London except for diet doctors. And she'd been trying to get me to go to one for years. She had tricked me. <laughs> so I turned her to the doctor and then he looked at me and he said, you're fat. And I said, I know I'm fat, I said, <laughs> but I'm also itchy. He said, well, do you have a, a dog in that office? Well, England is a nation of dog lovers and there are many dogs in offices and we did. He said, well, clearly that office dog has got fleas. Here, take these pills and go and lose weight. So I took the doctor's pills. I took my father's vitamins. I didn't lose any weight and I, I stayed itchy. Well, we came to June just before the wedding, a couple of days before the wedding, and I was so itchy. I was waking up in the middle of the night weeping. I was so itchy. But the wedding was coming up, and I wanted to enjoy every moment of it. So again, I compartmentalized, took a bit of more time to shove it into a, into a corner, deciding I, I wanted to love this wedding, every moment of it, and I knew it was going to be marvelous. People were coming from all over the place. They were coming from all over England, all over Europe, and there was a contingency coming from Texas because that's where my sister-in-law was from originally. And those Texans arrived in their boots and their drawers and their hats. And there was one young man who was my, my future and now sister-in-law's cousin who was very handsome. He was just a few years older than me and he twinkled at me and I twinkled right back. <laughs> And he carried on twinkling all the way through the wedding. And, oh, I had the loveliest time. It made what was already going to be a wonderful wedding even more marvellous. Well, the service, oh, it was so beautiful. And Nancy looked absolutely lovely. I hate to admit it, even my brother was handsome. And the reception was marvellous. There was this wonderful band, and I've always loved to dance. So I danced with every single man there. I even got someone out of a wheelchair and had a, a little shuffle. Yes, I was a, a bouncing balloon of bubbling joy. Yes, I was, yes. And I was even more thrilled that, that at the end of the evening, the Texan who had twinkled said he'd decided to stay on for a week and would I give him a tour and show him around London and, and some of the, the home counties? Well, of course, I was absolutely thrilled. We had a lovely time. And we came to the last afternoon. He was flying back early the next day. And we were having a cream tea in a little tea shop. And we were chatting away. And then he suddenly got very quiet and very still. And he picked up my hand and he said, Geraldine, how long have you had those? Now, between the webs of my finger, I had all these little red bumps. And I said, oh, I said, probably since late January. He said, and tell me, are you very, very itchy? I said, well, yes, I am, but I didn't think you'd notice. I kept going round corners to have a quick itch while you weren't, when you, so that you couldn't, so you couldn't see. He said, well, Geraldine, I know what you've got because I've had it and it now means that I have it. You have scabies. And I said, what scabies? I'd never heard of it before. He said, it's not unto death. 
He said it's about as easy to get and as embarrassing and as easy to get rid of or as hard to get rid of as head lice. He said they're little insects that crawl under the skin, which make you very itchy. They don't affect the hair or the groin, but they affect everything else. So I told my mother. She sent me off to a specialist, a skin specialist. And he said, oh, yes, Miss Buckley. Yes, you do have a case of scabies, a very, very bad case of scabies. In fact, it's the worst case of scabies I've ever seen. It's very, very virulent, very virulent. In fact, you're terribly infectious. Indeed, you're so infectious that if you held anyone's hand or even patted their hand, they would get scabies. He said, tell me, have you been around many people recently? <laughs> I thought of the wedding. I thought of those 60 men that I danced with. Clearly I was a bouncing balloon of infectious joy. So I told my mother, I said, mother, we're going to have to phone up every man I dance with and tell them to get checked. And my mother, thinking of the society wedding and all the organization that had gone into it said, over my dead body. Well, divine retribution always comes around. Sometimes it happens very quickly and sometimes it takes many years. Well, with my mother, whom I loved enormously, it happened very quickly. I'd held her hands. I gave her scabies. I gave my brother, my brother who had done so many terrible things to me over the years, I gave him scabies. He gave it to his new wife and they hitched, they, they hitched, they itched. <laughs> they, they itched all the way through the honeymoon. Now, intellectually, I know it is a terrible thing to give a wedding gift that carries on giving. <laughs> but emotionally, can I truly say that I am sorry that after so many years, Damien got his divine comeuppance? Can I say that I, I am truly, truly sorry? Not in the slightest. Thank you, Lord! <laughs> Thank you, Lord! <laughs> Thanks for joining us for a little story from The Appleseed.